You're listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby, Director of Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston. This is the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. It's so awesome to be here. Welcome back to the Muslim Master Class. Tonight's topic, tonight's trait, is so fundamental that in the first parsha talking about the mitzvahs commanded to the Jewish people, which is this Torah portion, the parsha of Mishpatim, it actually talks about tonight's trait, which is Midvar Sheker Tirchak. Never tell a lie. That's We all grew up with that song, Midvar Sheker Tirchak, never tell a lie. But the literal translation of it is from a word that is false, distance yourself. Distance yourself from a word that is false. Now, it, there's about 100 commentaries asking the follow, answering, trying to figure out the answer to the following question. There is no other mitzvah in the Torah that it tells you distance yourself from it. This is something bad. Distance yourself from it. The only time we find that is when it comes to something which is not truthful. Something that is untruthful, distance yourself from it. That's very unique. We don't find that but any other mitzvah, positive or negative. The obvious question is, why? Why do we have this commandment? So we need to understand like this. First is, what does it mean? What does it mean that someone speaks falsehood? So our sages tell us that there are many different types of lies. The Chavetz Chaim brings it down. I found it today in the Chavetz Chaim. There are different types of lies. There are lies that give you benefit. There are lies that don't give you benefit. For example, so someone is a witness to a, a, a story that happens and he lies. Why? Because... He wants to benefit his friend. He says, oh, hey, you know, he was paying attention. He was on his phone, right? He was, every- so he lies so that this friend gets a benefit from the insurance company or for whatever it is, he lies. That's one lie. There's another type of lie. We're just lying to add flavor to the story. We were going 240 miles an hour, and there's another car analogy right there, and you know, and it was, you know, and the plane was, the, the, the turbulence was insane and things were flying in the air. You, you just exaggerate for the sake of being a good storyteller, for people enjoying, for people to just like feed off your, you know, your, oh, what a guy. He's got all the greatest stories, right? That's another type. There's another type of lie which causes damage to another person. And you can go on. There are many different types. You see, the Torah doesn't distinguish between different types of lies. The Torah doesn't distinguish between different types of falsehood. The Torah tells us that if something is false, distance yourself from it. All types. It doesn't make a difference what type. In fact, the commentary here says, regarding no other transgression does the Torah say that one should distance himself. So much does God abhor falsehood, that we are commanded to stay far away from even an appearance of a lie, even if it might appear to be a lie. You know, it, it, we are so careful about being truthful in, in, in Judaism. I'll give you an example of how cautious halacha is about it. It says that if you are the gabai, the gabai is the person, the gizbar, in every community, is the person who gives out the charity. He gives out the charity. Someone goes over to him and says, you know, you know, I lost my job. I don't have money to pay my rent. So they'd go to the, to the gabai, and the gabai would give out tzedakah for the community. And the, all the people who would contribute would contribute to this general pot. Today, you have federations and Jewish family service that do that, and there's a whole process. But it used to be that you'd just go to the gabai, and the gabai would, you know, speak to the rabbi and say, "Is this a good enough cause? Okay, we're going to do that, and we're going to, and they contribute whatever amount of money." Or if it was a loan, sometimes the guy says, "Listen, I just need to get my business on, on you know, off the ground. I need a loan of, uh, you know, a thousand dollars." Okay, great. So he gives him the loan, 
And then the halacha says something very interesting. If you are the gabai and you're in charge of that money and someone comes to pay you back for that loan, make sure that you keep the money of the community in a separate pocket. Intentionally, in a separate pocket or in a separate envelope. Why? So people shouldn't come into doubts whether or not you're being truthful. You see to what degree? To such a degree, we go out of the way to ensure that no one should suspect that perhaps there's something which is not truthful. We go out of our way. That's how careful the Torah is to ensure that nobody even remotely seems to be with the falsehood. Okay. Now, I want to bring you to something. We haven't really done much of this in our class, so I, want, I need, I need your, 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 your heart and your, your concentration here, okay? We know that the name of Hashem... Sorry, before I say that, there's a Talmud. The Talmud in Sota, Tractate Sota, 42a, says the following thing. There are four categories of people that are never to be in the presence of God. They don't get to be in the presence of God. Who are these four categories of people? Number one is those who speak Lashon Hara. Number two is the people who mock other people. You laugh at other people. Number three is people who are flatterers. And number four are those who are liars, those who speak untruthful words. So we have four things, four categories. These four categories, it says, Enam ro'im pnei They do not see the presence of God. They can't be in the midst of God. They can't be in, in the midst of God's presence. Okay. Those who speak slander, lashon hara. Those who, speak, who mock other people. Those who are flatterers and those who are liars. So the obvious question is, is what's really going on here? Why these four? What is so unique about these four that they cannot? What's about someone who steals? No, he can be in God's presence. He can he can repent. He can these four they have no place in, in in the realms of God's presence, of God's divine presence. Influence. They can't be. They're, they're a complete uh, repudiation of godliness. And wherever God's presence is, they can't be. So let me share with you one of the most incredible teachings from the Maharal. Maharal was known to be able to dissect traits, to be able to dissect their source their connection with godliness, and bring it to very simple understanding. So we know that the source of this world, everything in this world, is sourced in the letters of the Aleph Bet. If we understood the secrets of Kabbalah, we can bring this world to an end. We can bring Mashiach here tomorrow. In fact, in the Talmud, and even in, in the later generations, only 100, 200 years ago, there were sages who were able to end the exile. We're right now in exile, just to remind everyone. We don't have our homeland. We don't have our temple rebuilt. At the time of the coming of Mashiach, we will have it rebuilt. The sages were able to end the exile. All they got to do is put together the letters of the alphabet in the proper way and make that decree, that pronunciation, and that's it. The world would end the way, the way we know it now. The world was created with the letters of the alphabet. Just very interesting. Last week's Torah portion, we talked about the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments begin with the letter Aleph, Anochi Hashem Lokecha. But we know the Torah begins with the letter Bet, which is the second letter of the alphabet. And it really doesn't make any sense. The Torah should begin with the letter Aleph. Why does it begin with the letter Bet? doesn't make any sense. It's missing. Something is missing from the beginning of the Torah that the Torah begins with the second letter of the alphabet, not the first. 
sometimes you need to jump ahead to get to the fir- to the beginning. You need to go start learning the story of Genesis. You need to learn the story of creation. You need to learn all of that to get to the point where you'll get to what existed before the bet. The bet was creation already, but what existed before creation? Ah, Aleph. What is Aleph? Aleph is God. Aleph, the word Aleph, it comes from the word Aluf, which means master. Every morning we say a special prayer called Adon Olam. Why is God called Adon Olam? And why do we say it in the morning prayer? Because the first person ever to call God Adon, master, was Abraham. The morning prayer, Shacharit, is the prayer of Abraham. So in his prayer, we say Adon Olam, which is master of the universe. Aleph from the Ten Commandments originated way before creation. But you have to get to it. You have to get to the point where if if you just opened up the Torah and it said, Anochi Hashem Lekecha, I am Hashem your God, there would be no context to it. You wouldn't know what in the world you're talking about. Oh, 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 the world was created by who? By Anochi Hashem Lekecha, by the Aleph, by the master of the universe. So, but what is the letter Aleph? Just to give you a, a, right? We know what's the numerical value of God's name is 26. If you take the Aleph and you divide up the three parts of the Aleph, there's a Yud, there's a Yud, and there's a Vav. A Yud is 10. So you have two Yuds, that's 20. And the Vav is 6. You have 26, just in the letter Aleph of God's name. By the way, if you look at the Aleph, at the top of the Aleph, you'll see that there's two yuds, right? There's one one facing down and one facing up. If you look at the one facing up, it will look identical to my hand right here. It looks like a finger pointing up to the heavens. All right? And it looks like, like a hand, like this, pointing up. That's the top of the Aleph. To remind us, Aleph is Hashem. So now, that's not what class is about today. But I want to bring you into that world of the letters. Let's take the four letters of God's name, the Yud and the He, the Vav and the He, which is the four letters. You're not supposed to say it out out in one shot, which is why I separate between and for each letter. You're not supposed to say, you're not supposed to pronounce that name, the Yud, the He, and the Vav and the He. It's intentional, okay? So... What is the letter Yud? It's very interesting that what, what did we just do with the letter Aleph? We split it into three letters, right? We split it into two Yuds and a Vav. Every letter of the Aleph bet you can split into other letters, except for one. There's only one letter that cannot be split, and that's the letter Yud. You know why? Because the letter Yud represents Hashem's oneness. Hashem is one. There's no two gods. There's one God. We say in the Shema, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hashem is one. Only one. There's no halves to God. You can't split God in half. There are multiple, multiple dimensions in understanding God, but God is one. Only one. So now, Let's go through some of those four and we'll understand the character of how they contradict each of these four letters. So the first letter is Yud. Yud means oneness, oneness of God. What's the second letter? Hey. Hey means creation. God created the world. God created the world. What does that mean that when... uh, We've brought this example before. Remember those Walkmans? You ever see a broken Walkman? You ever see a broken one who's cracked in half? You know what was inside there? A gazillion wires. You had this button with a wire all around, a yellow wire all around the whole box getting to this speaker. You had that button with a zigzag and a whole thing getting it to another place. All of these wires. Now let's say you opened it up very carefully. You unscrewed the thing, it didn't fall, you just unscrewed it and you just decided, I'm going to just take out the blue wire just randomly because the blue wire probably doesn't need to be there. 
right? Anybody find that make sensible? No, because no manufacturer will put in extra things just for, you know, just for the kicks of it. You know, we're just going to throw in extra wires. You get into your brand new Tesla and you open up the, uh, the frunk and you take out the, 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 in the, in the, under the hood, you say, oh, this wire connecting this battery to that battery, that's just extra. We don't need it. Let's just pull it out. What's going to happen? Something's not going to work right. You don't just put extra things into your creation, right? Elon Musk wasn't trying to play games. He wanted to create the most of, most incredible vehicle, and that was his goal, not by putting extra things in there for no reason. So if that wire is there, I can bet you it needs to be there. Okay. So that's hey. Hey is creation. God creates a world where everything needs to be there. Vav. Vav is the letter of continuation. By the way, with the letter hey, why do I say it's creation? Because the Torah tells us, Behi baram, God created the world with the letter hey. Because the letter hey has like a dalid, and then it has a loose part, which is not connected to anything. Our sages tell us that we are all born at the top of that hay, and then if God forbid we sin, we fall into the to home, into the emptiness, into the nothingness of the world but we can always come back. And that's the secret of creation. God created a world where we can always come back, which is why all of God's creations are round. Everything that God ever created is round. Even the human bones is incredible. Every bone is round. There's no square bone. Everything is round. The planets are all round. The constellations are all round. The rocks are all round, and so are the molecules of of water and everything else that you'll find. Everything is round. Trees are round. What comes out of the trees is not. The leaves and things like that. That comes out. Even that has roundness to it. But the idea here is, is that God is constantly reminding us that everybody can come back. Everything has an opportunity to return. Meaning, you make a mistake, don't worry about it. We all make mistakes. Be encouraged. Don't be discouraged. There's an opportunity to repent. You can make amends. You can come around again. Just like you went down, you fell down, you can come back up. So the, what is the letter Vav? The letter Vav is a letter that connects. It's a letter of continuation. Anytime you have a word that starts with the letter Vav, it's a letter which connects it to the previous statement. So if I say, um, I like chocolate in Hebrew, I have chocolate, ve gam, I add the letter Vav, and also, meaning I'm adding to what I said before, I love chocolate and I love I'll do something healthy now. And I love water. So the, the vav is an and. It's attaching. It's connecting. It's extending what you said previously. And therefore, whenever you see the letter vav, it refers to, the, to God continuing this world, sustaining this world. And then we have the last hay. The first hay was creation. The second hay is the rebirth of creation. There's constantly a newness in creation. In fact, our sages tell us that every moment of our existence is a new moment of existence, which is why if one sins, our sages say in the morning, if they're righteous, in the morning, you can't consider them a sinner. You saw them sin the night before. it, it, It could be considered that they most likely, it should be considered that they most likely repented that night. Why? Because there's a newness. We're a new person. We're constantly being renewed. Anybody feel exactly the way they felt three months ago? No, we feel totally different. We're a different person. Anybody feel exactly the way they felt a year ago? No way. We think that we'll feel the way we feel now forever, but we don't. We're constantly evolving and changing as human beings. The world that Hashem created is constantly new. So let's stop for a second and see what are those four categories 
and how do they contradict God's existence? We had the letter Yud, the letter Hey, and then the letter Vav and the letter Hey. These are this is God's essence, so to speak. Oneness. Well, what is a flatterer? What is a flatterer? Someone who flatters is someone who says one thing in their mouth and one thing in their heart. They say, wow, those are beautiful earrings. And then when you're like, oh, thank you so much, and they turn around, they're like, ugliest earrings ever, right? So they're, 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 they're two-faced. They say one thing but mean another thing. They happen to be beautiful. Okay, so, so happy birthday. So, so that's the way it works. If you say something which is two-faced, you're contradicting yourself from God, because God is only one. God doesn't have two faces. Hashem is echad, we said. One, you're being two, you're a contradiction to God. Therefore, you don't get to see the presence of God. You don't reside in the midst of God because you're pushing yourself away by being a two-faced, by being a flatterer. What is the other one? The hey, creation. God created the world. We, we established that when someone creates something, they don't create something in vain. They don't just throw in an extra wire in there. They put every single thing in there because it's necessary. God is the manufacturer of this world. Does he put in an extra human being into this world? No. God puts you here because he believes in you, because he, his world needs you. What does a mocker do? Someone who mocks other people? They're diminishing someone's existence. They're, <laughs> they're laughing at that guy and they're laughing at... And everybody is on the altar to be slaughtered by the comedians, by those who mock others. They're mocking the creation that God thought the world can't survive without. And they mock them. That's someone who contradicts God. That's someone who can't be in the presence of God. What's Vav? Vav is the one that relates to our trait tonight. The only thing that is sustainable in this world is truth. If you do not have truth, you will not stand. If you think of the analogy of A, take the letters of the Aleph Bays and put them on a straight line. All the letters, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey. The first letter is the letter Aleph. The middle letter is the letter Mem. The last me- letter is the letter Taf. That is the word Emet, which is truth. The first, middle, and last letter is Emet. Aleph, Mem, and Taf. It's stable. All of those three letters have two legs Why? Because truth stands. Truth will survive through thick and thin. Truth has legs. It will survive. On the other hand, our trait that we're talking about tonight, which is sheker, they're all the way at the end of the letters of the alphabet. The shin, kuf, resh, and then you have the taf. And they all stand on one leg. A lie will eventually fall. Yeah, we can stand on one leg for a while, But for how long? Eventually, you'll fall. You'll lose your balance. You'll get weak. Eventually, the falsehood falls. And therefore, when God represents Vav, which is a continuation, which is truth, what is falsehood? That's a contradiction to it. And therefore, the Talmud tells us that someone who speaks falsehood cannot be in the presence of God. And the last one is those who speak Lashon Hara. And that contradicts also speaking negatively about another person. It kills them. So there's no more sustenance. There's no more sustaining of that person. The Maharal brings here these four categories of people contradict the the existence of God. And therefore, they cannot be in the presence of God. 
That's how terrible telling the untruth is. It contradicts the very essence of God. You know, it's if it's even more it, because God is all truth, and that's it's. It, I was thinking about this all day today. Like, why does it use this terminology of midvah sheker tirchak? It should say, do not lie. Instead, it says in this week's portion, by the fifth aliyah, second verse after the at, into the the aliyah, it says midvar sheker tirchak. From any words of falsehood, distance yourself. Any words. Any words, which means to tell us something very, very important. I think probably the most important point of the entire class tonight, and that is falsehood is a disease. We don't say, you know what, let's play around with COVID a little bit, just to, you know, like, let's get comfortable with it a little. No, we say we want nothing to do with it. We wear masks to protect ourselves. We distance ourselves we, for ourselves for a long time from other people so that there not be any transmission from one person to another. We do everything we can. There's the, there is a disease called falsehood, lying. Distance yourself so you, that you don't get infected. Distance yourself so you don't have any type of connection. Why? Because if we want to be people of godliness, we want to be people who are connected to God, what is the prerequisite for that? Truth. Truth, truth, truth. And we've discussed, you know, one of the challenges is that what if someone asks you your opinion about something? Are you supposed to lie? We mentioned this in one of the Talmud classes recently. There's a disagreement in the Talmud. What should you tell a bride? What should you tell a bride? One opinion says, Kala nava chasuda. She's so pretty. She's so beautiful. The other says, Kala kamos shehi. You say the truth exactly the way it is. What? What? What do you mean? You need to share all her dark secrets. You need to share what? It's like, what does that mean? Our sages explain that if you look at the truth of a human being, you'll see their greatness. Of course you have to share the truth. You always have to share the truth. Every person's got virtue. Find that virtue and that's what you need to share. You need to find the goodness of them. Not, the, not God forbid, to display their flaws. Everyone's got flaws. Don't get worried. Everyone's got flaws. But everyone's got tremendous virtue too. That's what you need to do. You see a bride, tell her spouse how special she is. Don't brush it over and lie and say, oh, she's she's wonderful, magnificent. Say that find the truth. Because the truth will be that she is magnificent. There's no need to lie. If someone is not careful, I had a couple of questions that I asked my rabbi over the years about different scenarios that, that, that came up from students. People called me and said, that I mentioned this story recently uh, in one of the classes. I apologize if I'm repetitive. There was a young woman who called me. She ordered something from one of the, super, one of the stores, one of the big stores, and it was available for pickup. And they said, okay, your pickup window is between this time and that time up till this date. After this date, at this time, let's pick a time, right? Uh, Friday at noon. After Friday at noon, you know, we're putting it back into our inventory and your order will be canceled. So she suddenly realizes, oh, I think I missed it. I'm going anyway. I was, she was on her way and she, uh, she goes to the store and she gets the notice already. She already got the email that her order was canceled and that they, they're they putting it back into the stock, into the, into the inventory. She says, okay, I'm ready here. I'm going to ask for it. So she goes, she gives her name, and uh, they say, oh, yeah, here's your, here's, your, here's your order. She gets her order. And then she leaves. 
And she gets an email due to non pickup. We canceled your order and we refunded your card. So she called me to ask me this question. Am I allowed to keep this item that they made a mistake and gave me back my money? So it's a real halacha question. It's, there's, there's, a, there's a nice thing to do, but then there's also a legal thing. Are you obligated to return it? And the answer is, by letter of the law, you're not obligated to return it. Not in American law and not in Jewish law. But this is what my rabbi said. Two things. First, you'll never benefit. How much did you save? $50 on your item? $200 on your on the dress? Guess what? You wonder why you have a leak from the roof for $200 repair? Right? It, 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 God, God evens the score. You'll never benefit. That's number one. But there's something which is much more serious about this. And that is you can fall into a habit of being untruthful. And that is very dangerous. Just for that reason alone, it's worth it to go back to the store and explain to them what happened. And this once happened to me with an item that my wife, you know, today people buy things online and then they return it online. And sometimes you hope that they get it right. If the intelligence of the people there is, you know, 50% 50% right of what it should be, then they should get it right. But sometimes that doesn't happen. So my wife was once credited more than she was supposed to. She told me, you know what, if you're going in that area, if you don't mind going to the store, she sent me with the receipt. She sent me with both receipts, what we purchased, what we returned. And I went to the store and I, I said to the lady, I said, I, I know you're going to think I'm crazy, Okay. But this is the purchase and this is the return. You gave us too much money back on the return and I I need to make that difference. I think it was like $12 or something. So the lady's like, no, 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 one second. She she couldn't figure out how is it possible that they actually gave us money. And I was like, no, 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 I'm, I'm trying to explain. She had to call a manager and then it was like, it was a whole story for them. And then the lady's like, you know what? I'm the manager here. I have a, a little flexibility. It's too complicated for me to fix this. Just take it and go, okay? Just take it and go. You know, and they do have, they do have, and I, I verified this later, that they do have a certain uh, wiggle room that they can make certain discounts and they can, you know, up to a certain amount of a certain dollar amount. But you understand that sometimes it's very, it's very difficult, but we want to train ourselves to not be people who are living in a world of falsehood. My mother, my entire life, growing up, may she live and be well in good health. She always, if if we owed someone money, you borrowed money from a friend, be so careful to return it. Every penny. To be truthful to the last penny. I was like, tell me who it is. I remember when I was leaving to Israel, there was someone I needed to pay for for a certain... um, thing right right after my wedding so we we had bought something and they they said we'll invoice you and they never got the invoice to me i remember before i left to israel i called my mother i said i think i never got the invoice from the guy my mother was like okay give me their number give me their address she ended up going down driving to downtown brooklyn to the guy's warehouse telling him, you never invoiced us we need to pay because our sages tell us that if you leave this world owing someone money which, by the way, talking about truthfulness, the first question that we're asked in the world of all truth after we finish this, our job in this world is were we truthful? Were we truthful? Did you do business honestly? Did you interact with the world with honesty? Were you putting on a fake show to the world? Or were you real? Because God's world is all about truth, and you can't be in God's world living a falsehood. It's a contradiction. We have to understand that being truthful means that you're being wanting and willing to be in a world connected with the Almighty. Someone who doesn't live in a world of truthfulness is pushing off God and saying, God, I don't want to live in your presence. 
That's the challenge with falsehood, which is why the Torah tells us, distance yourself in every possible way from falsehood. Any type of falsehood. Yeah, even that type. Because A, there's never going to be a benefit. Exactly what we spoke about, we're going to talk about it more when you talk about jealousy, the trait of jealousy. Did we talk about it? We talked about it. Yeah, it's okay. So I'm losing it. I'm telling you, I'm getting old. So the what is jealousy? Jealousy is not realizing, I think it was last week, right? Jealousy is not realizing that everything that the Almighty has decided you should have, you will have. And if you don't have it, he didn't want you to have it. Looking at what someone else has and desiring it is a terrible thing. Still, the Torah doesn't say, distance yourself from it like it does from this. It says, it does say, don't be jealous. It does say, don't covet. It does say that in the Big Ten. Okay, in the Ten Commandments, it says that. But we see other traits. It doesn't, doesn't tell us that. About falsehood, distance yourself from anything having to do with falsehood. Why? Because it's a total repudiation of godliness. You know, if you look in in Psalms 101, Dover Shkarim, someone who speaks falsehood, lo yikon lenegedenai, will not be opposite my eyes. God can't see someone who lives a lie. God can't someone see someone who is speaking a lie. It's a total, like we said, a total repudiation of godliness. Even the white lies. You know, there was a, a group of students who once went to their rabbi and they said, Rabbi, what do we need to, to know when we talk about exaggeration? He says, oh, you mean lying? There's no such thing as exaggeration. Exaggeration means something which is not truthful. And a person, even if there's no harm, no foul, no one's going to get hurt by me saying something exaggerating, saying something which is not truthful. Not hurting anyone. You are hurting someone. You're hurting yourself. Because you're getting into the habit that things that are not truthful, it's okay. And right now, it starts with things that don't harm anyone. But soon enough, it'll become things that hurt other people. And that's why the Torah says, Tirchak, distance, 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 all you can from something which isn't truthful. Would any of us do business with someone who we know is untruthful? No, but it was only with, uh, you know... uh, he got a deal and he, you know, he tricked them a little. No, 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 no. We, we would, would we want our child to marry someone who has a reputation of being untruthful? Truthfulness is not a, it's something that we all understand. What do we teach our children, little children? We say the truth. Even if it hurts. If a child is ready to admit their wrongdoing, even though they will be punished for it and they know they'll be punished for it, you know that their shorish, their source, their root of their positive traits is truthfulness. And it's 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 a very it's a very important thing for parents to notice that in your children. If your child is the truth seeker, build it up, strengthen it. They should never weaken that. Now, not everyone has that as a, as, as a natural as a natural reality. Some people have to work on it. Some people are born with, oh, well, be politically correct. We'll just, you know, we'll flower the numbers a little bit. We'll just, you know, no. What's the truth? And you know what? The truth is not always so pretty. One of my favorite ideas my rabbi told told me, it says that after the Shema, by the way, at the end of the Shema, we talk at the beginning of Shema, we say, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. 
What do we say at the end of the Shema? Hashem Elokechem Emet. Hashem, your God, is truth. He's true. Everything about him. But then we list off 15 virtues of the Almighty. So it starts off with truth, and then the last one, Vitov, and good, God is good, Viafe and beautiful. So my rabbi asked, I don't understand. Shouldn't truth and beauty be one next to the other? They should be right next to each other, the two virtues that are so beautiful. Truth should be beautiful. He says, no. Usually what's truthful is not beautiful. And what's beautiful is not truthful. If you look at our politicians, they're great orators. They speak so well, so nicely. And yet we know that not a word is true. And then when you have those who speak the words of truth, oh, but they're offensive. It's so offensive, right? So, so when you have truth, it's not always so pretty. And when you have things that are pretty words, they're not always so true. And that's the lesson we're learning here. And it could also be that Hashem prefers you give up on it being so pretty for the sake of the truth. Our sages tell us something amazing here. That sadly in this world that we're living in, there is nothing more prevalent than falsehood. There's nothing more common than lies. And because it's so common, the Torah doesn't give a specific commandment telling us, don't lie. It says, distance yourself from anything having to do with a lie. Anything that has anything to do with falsehood, just go away. Go the other way. You know, in the back of the fire trucks, it says, keep back 200 feet. The same thing for a falsehood. Keep back 200 feet. Just stay away from it. The Mishnah in Ethics of Our Fathers tells us something so critically important. It says, Be very careful with your words. Shema mitocham yilmedu l'shaker. That perhaps from your words, your children, your students, your friends who hear you talking, they might learn to lie. If you're not accurate with your words, your children are standing around. They're listening to everything you say. Your students are standing around. They're listening to what you say. And if you're not 100% cautious about your words, they're going to say, well, it wasn't 100% true. I guess it's okay to lie. And they use you as the source. God forbid. The Mishnah warns us, be very careful with your words so that no one, God forbid, leaves with the wrong impression and thinks that it's okay to say something which is false. There's also, so there's a special caution here. Caution of learning to lie or be untruthful. So, When we talk about God, we have to understand that God is 100% true. True. In everything that he says. Okay, you know, it's like it, we learned this a long time ago. We were talking about the animamins, the, the principles of, of faith. One of them is to believe in the prophets. And the Rambam goes into detail about how we can determine whether or not a prophet is true or not. How do you know for profit if you can trust them? Now, just we'll take a little break here for a second. All of you know the torch is a nonprofit. And as a nonprofit, sadly, we need to raise money. And we only do that once a year. And as such, I ask all of you, if you haven't done so already, please go to givetorch.net and contribute. Thank you for all those who have. I appreciate it. We all appreciate it. Not only, I want you to know something. Okay, for those of you who heard this, I spoke about this in my podcast yesterday. I made a very short podcast giving three reasons why it's important. Very short. 
but I really believe this. I think for only for the reason, not only if you enjoy classes and you enjoy podcasts, okay, that's a good reason, very nice. You enjoy it, you, it's something which is much higher. You imagine that someone out in the middle of the Amazon is sitting there with their phone listening to a torch class that was made possible because of a contribution that you made. You will never, ever know the influence you had on someone else, and they don't know who in the world supported this. They have no idea. You have a portion in that. I th- and I think it's it's the most remarkable thing because we have the analytics. My dear friends, we had over a million downloads last year. One million people downloaded podcasts last year. I don't know if it's people or episodes, but a million of them. And they're an, an average of an hour, a million hours of Torah study. And you know what? Everywhere across the globe, they're listening. I mentioned this pre- recently. I never even knew there were Jews in Singapore, but apparently there are. Apparently there's a big Jewish community there. And they're listening to the podcast too. Right? The Netherlands. I mean, I, I, I look at the, at the analytics and I'm like surprised. And guess what? Each one of you have a portion in the Torah study that they learn with us because of your contribution. That, to me, is the most exciting part of all of this. So we don't like to do fundraisers. We're not an organization. Many organizations exist so that they can raise money. We exist so that we can teach Torah. Unfortunately, we need to raise money. So we try to do that only one day a year, which is going to be, I mean, officially it's tomorrow morning till Thursday night. But we did an earlier uh, pre-run, which was Sunday to, to Thursday. But uh, really, it's, it's, tomorrow is going to be the big kickoff where we're going to be, you know, pounding the pavement tomorrow, uh, hoping that everybody contributes and contributes generously so that we don't have to be busy. And even, by the way, even in the middle of the, of the whole campaign, we don't stop any classes. The classes continue. Everything continues as normal. Nothing changes. We just ask the community to be our partners. And it's really a partnership. It's not like, you know, oh, it's nice words. It really is. We can't exist without the contributions of every single one of you. So we thank you. I thank you in advance. The entire team thanks you. And every single person who listens to the podcasts and enjoys them and grows and changes from them. And I can tell you, I was in Israel last summer. I was in Israel also this winter. But last summer, I met a couple of individuals who tapped me on my shoulder. They said, you Rabbi Wolby? I said, yeah. From Houston? I'm like, yeah. Like, I, I know everything about you. I'm like, what do you mean know everything about me? You're like, I don't think we ever met. What's your name? <laughs> it's like, like, no, no, no. I'm... I'm Torah observant today because of you. I'm like, what do you mean you're Torah observant? I've been listening to your podcast. And I've been listening to you. I said, no, no, I think you mean my brother. I said, because I always, I know that my brother, my brother's the king of podcasts, Rabbi Yaakov Volby. He's phenomenal. He's incredible. They're like, no, no, no. It was actually yours. Thank you very much. So, um, so I never met this guy before. I had no idea who he is. The guy comes over and says that his life was changed and I hear it all the time. Torah has impact. It's not me. Thank you. It's not me. It's the Torah that we teach that has unbelievable power. The Torah that we learn together. We all have the opportunity through this campaign. And it it generally would be right behind me on the big screen behind me. But I turned it off for class. It shouldn't be interruption. It shouldn't bother anyone. But if you can, go to givetorch.net and please contribute. Be our partner. We need partners. We're looking for partners. We want partners, and we appreciate our partners. So thank you, each and every one of us. So now what are we talking about? Profits, right? Torch is a nonprofit, but we do have profits. We had profits throughout the generations. And Moshe was the father of all prophets. Av l'kol anavim, all prophets. So how do we know if a prophet is real or if a prophet is false? The Rambam says you look at every detail that they say. So... And if one detail is off, one single solitary detail is off, they're a false prophet. If one. So how does that, how does that work? So let's say the prophet says, I'll tell you why I'm a prophet. Believe me, because at 12 o'clock sharp tomorrow afternoon, 
You're going to hear a lightning. You're going to see a lightning. You're going to hear a thunder. And there's going to be a downpour. And every street in the neighborhood is going to be flooded, except for Glenfield Court, where Torch is on. Every, every street, God forbid, Hashem, please protect us. And at 12 o'clock, sharp, you're going to see the lightning, you're going to hear the thunder, it's going to be a heavy downpour. Every street is going to be flooded except for Glenfield Court. And within an hour, it's all going to be clear. Everything is going to be cleared away. Okay. Comes 12 o'clock and on the dot, there's lightning, there's thunder, there's a heavy downpour. And all the streets get flooded except for Glenfield Court. Wow. What a miracle. But it takes three days for the water to subside. They're a false prophet. Huh? What do you mean they're a false prophet? Everything they said, but one little point. One little point. Everything of a prophet, every word they say needs to be truthful. If one little fact is not accurate, they're a false prophet. The Rambam says, you know from that little falsehood, that's not where God's problem. Yeah, they can have a vision, they can have insight, they can have intuition, they can have a sixth sense, but a prophet they're not. Why? Because you can't be a representative of God's message in that way with falsehood. Only truth. And what this week's Parsha is teaching us is that anything that has even a little hint of falsehood, stay away. Distance yourself as much as you can. By the way, there's a lot of that in media. I've already many, many months, I've been completely, I shut out completely of all news. You know why? There's too much falsehood. You don't know what to believe anymore. What does the Torah command us in this week's parsha? Distance yourself from falsehood. So I do, I'm trying to do that. If you have a friend, you have a neighbor. I had a guy to come in here once. He says, so and so, he just can't help himself. He doesn't know how to say the truth. He says, for no reason. He just can't say the truth. It's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing that someone can't. Like for, it's not like he has any benefit. Like you don't know what to believe already. What yes to believe, what not to believe. So Hashem should bless us all. That we all want to be close to God. We should all take this message from this week's parsha and distance ourselves from all falsehood so that we can be close to God. God who is truth and is the essence of truth and is the source of all truth. In order to be close to God, we need to distance ourselves from falsehood. Hashem should give us the strength. He should give us the power. He should give us the insight. And he should give us the, 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 the fortitude to stand up and walk away when something is false. Distance yourself from falsehood. My dear friends, thank you so much for coming here tonight. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you so much for a wonderful evening together. One second, because it's already Wednesday now, because it's Tuesday night is already Wednesday, we can start wishing each other have a good Shabbos. Have a good Shabbos, everyone. You've been listening to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast, a Torch production. Become a supporter at torchweb.org because your assistance enables more Torah learning around the globe. To find more lessons offered by Torch, please visit torchpodcast.com.